Hi, Biology class. Mr. Wagner here, fi fi finishing up with our third section on AV's notes. So again, you're going to have your note packet open. We left off last time at flight patterns, so that's where we're going to jump in, and we'll finish up our notes for today. Flight patterns of birds. There's powered flight. That's when you flap with a downward stroke of the wing to produce lift. That's what we normally think of when birds fly. They flap their arms up and down. Yep. Gliding is another way of flight. That's the use of air movement to fall slowly and gracefully. That is gliding. Soaring. Soaring is the use of thermal upcurrents. Those are currents that go upwards and they push up and a bird can soar up higher, rising on this circular pattern. Birds can then dar dive and start to climb again when they find these thermal upcurrents again. That's soaring. And then there are finally special flight patterns. Complicated cope motions of the wings produce a vertical reverse or a hovering flight. Think of like either the hummingbird that comes to a flower and just kind of hovers right where it is with its beak out, or the skylark, which can also do amazing flight things. All right, let's talk a little bit about the bird's anatomy, skeletal system. We talked about it earlier, they're strong and lightweight. Bones are filled with air, strengthened by internal cross bracing. So you see it kind of looks like a little bit of a sponge inside. It's not completely hollow. There's cross bracing, but there is a lot of open space for air to go, making it lighter. Only 5% of a bird's weight is in the bones. For humans, 14% of our weight is found in bones. So that's about a third. They have a third less weight in their bones than humans have. They have a large sternum that extends out from the rib cage. That's the red line there. That's the sternum, also called the keel. And it's the mounting point for powerful flight muscles. So when you have like a, a, a chicken breast that you eat, the breast is the big muscle and it's got to attach to a really strong bone Otherwise, it's going to pull, and that's the muscle necessary for flight. So it's got to have something strong to attach onto. So that's the keel. They also have lightweight skulls. They are toothless, no teeth. Lightweight bills are made of something called keratin. Keratin is uh, the same thing that's found in nails. Thin cranial bones, they have a short humerus, strength for attachment of flying muscles. The humerus, of course, is in the arm. That would be our humerus, would be the upper arm. And that's where the other flight muscles attach, not only to the chest, to the keel, but also to the humerus and uh, necessary for flight. Muscle systems. They have the pectoralis major. That's your chest muscle, your main chest muscle. It pulls the wing down in the power stroke. So this is the muscle that has the wing come down and pushes down. The pectoralis minor is the one that raises the wing after each stroke. And it kind of operates like a rope in a pulley system. It reduces the need for strong back muscles. Here's what they kind of look like. So again, there's the keel, there's the pectoralis major, the big breast muscle, and then of course the uh, muscle, of course, that pulls it back up again, the pectoralis minor. Let's talk a little bit about the nervous system. There are three parts to the bird's brain. They have the cerebrum that has two hemispheres. It controls voluntary behavior and allows for day-to-day -day functions. They also have the cerebellum. That's the place that has a muscle coordination and processes sensory messages. And then finally, the brainstem. The brainstem controls all the automatic functions. An automatic function would be like heartbeat or breathe, heartbeat or breathing. We don't think about those. They just happen automatically. It also controls the optic lobe. And the optic lobe is much more larger in birds than in mammals. Remember, we talked about all their different senses. The number one sense for a bird is sight. Eyesight is their number one sense. Nervous system. Some birds and some aquatic mammals have uh, exhibit unihemispherical slow wave sleep. What does that mean? It means they can literally turn half of their brain off to sleep while the other half remains awake. This is how birds are able to make nonstop trips over large bodies of water without resting. We said in some of those migrations, they fly for three or four days. You're like, how can you go three or four days without sleeping? Well, this is a neat function that God built into birds. They can actually take half of their brain and literally shut it off and let it sleep. And then after a while, it pops back on, and then the other half of the brain can then go to sleep. So it's called unispherical slow-wave sleep. Uni meaning one, hemisphere meaning only one hemisphere of the brain goes into a slow-wave sleep pattern while the other one is still completely active. Very, very neat. Senses. They have a poor sense of smell and taste. They have excellent hearing, and they also have excellent eyesight. They do not have an outer ear. 
The tube leads to the eardrum. They have a single bone in a cochlea that transmits the sound. Because of the need to distinguish between the differences of different bird calls, a bird needs to be able to distinguish differences in intensity and rapid fluctuation in pitches. So they have really, really good hearing as well. But their eyes are the best. Bird's eyes are almost completely immovable. So if you ever see a chicken that looks around, it always has to like move its head. And the reason is it can't move its eyeballs. So it has to move its whole head to look around. They have something called a nicotating membrane. A nicotating membrane is like a clear lid that is under the main lid. And when that lid comes up, it moistens the eye and it keeps it, uh, allows you to still see through it. So it allows the bird to moisten, moisten the cornea without closing their eyes. So in other words, they can have this transparent uh, membrane that come up over the eye so that when you're flying and all the wind gets in there, you know, you, you get big windy stuff, you have to close your eyes often because it dries your eye out. This nicotating membrane keeps the eye moist and allows them to continue flying even in hard wind and they don't have to close their eyes. Pretty cool. So here's kind of what it looks like. Here's the human's eye, which is on the right, and then the bird's eye, which is on the left. Reasons for good vision. They have larger eyes than human, have many more rods, those are the ones that detect light and dark, and more cones, those are the ones that detect color, and they have more than one fovea. A fovea is a, a place in the retina where the image that you come in from your eye, remember the image goes like this and it comes in and then it goes back out and it's upside down on my eyeball. They actually have two different fovea, two different places in which they can detect the image and so they have double the clarity. They can also see the color spectrum plus much of the UV range of the spectrum. Maybe you watch some of the Predator movies where the Predator has his, uh, has his mask on and he hits a little button on his thing and he can all of a sudden see in UV light. Uh, infrared would be like heat seeking, but the UV is the lower scale and he can see everything kind of in purples and, and grays and stuff. That's what birds can do. They can see in the UV spectrum. Let's talk a little bit about their digestive system. Relatively small size and great activity requires a great deal of fuel because again, birds are small and they do a lot of work. So birds absorb a very high percentage of the food they eat. They're able to eat and digest their food very quickly. So what does it mean if they have a high percentage of the food they eat? It means a lot of the food they take in, they have very, very little uh, either urine or poop that comes out. Okay, very, very small amounts come out because they use almost all of it. Different birds have different builds designed for what they eat. So here you can see some examples. The hawk has a sharp curved beak for tearing meat. The woodcock has a long beak for probing into trees. The bullfinch has a strong, sharp beak for ripping off buds. The parrot has a strong beak for cracking nuts open, and so on. The beaks depend upon what their diet is. Special parts of the digestive system. Birds have something called a crop. You can see in the picture there, we got the esophagus, and the esophagus leads down into something called the crop. Many of them have a special sac in their esophagus that serves as a storage chamber. It will release food at a proper rate to the rest of the system. So what it does is it helps maintain it. Instead of digesting their food all at once, they digest it slowly so that they can have the food uh, energy continually over a long period of time. The gizzard is the next section, a chamber of the digestive system found after the stomach that is muscular and has horny plates that sometimes contain grit to help grind the food up, a gizzard. One of the favorite things that I like to have in college, when I was at college, I'd go to a, a certain place and play pool with my friends and at this pool hall, in college, they would have pickled gizzards. What they would do is they would take these gizzards that were in birds, and then they would pickle them. And then you would eat them, and they were, they were fairly good. Pickled gizzards, one of my favorite meals. Birds also have something in their digestive system called the cloaca. It's an area of the digestive system where waste is expelled, so where poop comes out. But it's also the place where sperm is received for reproduction, where the eggs are released and where the waste from the kidneys are released. So in other words, they only have one tube on their backside leading out of their body. Uh, humans, of course, we have two tubes, one for urine and one for feces. And then, of course, we have uh, different tubes for reproduction. Birds only have one tube, and it serves all those functions together. The excretory systems. Birds complete, completely digest food in 45 minutes and get rid of the waste. For human beings, it takes us about 18 to 24 hours. So whatever you had kind of yesterday for supper, that's maybe what the next day you're finally uh, getting rid of your body or getting out of your body 
the next day, maybe around breakfast or lunch. Birds produce uric acid instead of urea. This does not have to be dissolved in water, and it keeps water in the bird. So in other words, that's why their uh, uric acid is one of the things that they have instead of urine. Urine is lots and lots of water. So in other words, they keep all their water. Uric acid is also an incredibly good fertilizer. So this bird poop is actually something you can put on crops, and it does an incredible job helping things grow. It's a natural fertilizer. Birds release their uric acid through the cloaca. Uric acid does not contain much water like urea, so birds then can conserve water. Some birds have a salt gland, which takes salt out of their body and puts it into a salty solution that runs through a duct in the nostrils. The salt gland allows marine birds to get the water they need by drinking seawater. So not, again, a really, really unique function. If there are birds like pelicans that live by the ocean or by water, and they scoop up fish from the water, and oftentimes they get lots and lots of salt water in their mouth, and they end up swallowing a lot of it, no problem. The salt gland in some of these birds helps take salt out of their body and put it back into the solution. So a salt gland, very helpful for birds, especially ones that live by the ocean where the water is salty. They have four chambered hearts. It's just like human beings. They have a high metabolism to keep the body at a constant temperature, so they have a very, very rapid heartbeat. A four-chambered heart is like the ultra top of the model line of hearts. It's the one that is the most efficient. It sends uh, from one chamber, uh, you receive blood. The second chamber sends it to the lungs. The third chamber receives the blood from the lungs with oxygen. Fourth chamber sends it out to the body. When we look at our unit on reptiles coming up, next we'll see that reptiles, most of them have a three-chambered hearts, and we'll see how that's not quite as efficient. So again, very efficient four-chambered hearts for birds. Here's what it looks like again. One, two, three, four chambers and all the blood vessels there. They also have a respiratory system. Respiratory system is completely different from every other living vertebrate. They literally breathe through their lungs instead of into them. We think of our lungs in here and the air has to go through our mouth, down the throat, and then into, through the windpipe, into our lung. They actually can have air come in and out of the lung. It doesn't have to go inside. It can literally go through it. The lungs do not need to expand and contract. They're right there and the air can simply pass through the lungs, unlike any other living vertebrate. Very, very cool. With this different way of breathing, birds are able to take more oxygen out of the air. The respiratory system allows birds to fly at very high altitudes and have enough oxygen. So if you get high enough altitude, the oxygen gets thinner and thinner and uh, it makes it harder and harder for humans to breathe. That's why if you like climb Mount Everest, very often people will take up oxygen because at the higher altitudes, there's not enough oxygen. But birds have a way of overcoming that by breathing through their lungs, not into them. Birds also have air sacs that are used to cool the body during flight. Those air sacs that we talked about not only makes the bird lighter, but it also keeps the bird really, really cool so it doesn't overheat when it's doing all this energy of flapping its wings constantly, hour after hour, or even day after day. Here's what the respiratory system looks like. Look at all these air sacs. It looks like there's a cervical air sac, one on each side of the body for two. There's an interclavical air sac, that's one of them. Anterior thoracic air sac, there's one on each side, that's two. There's my two lungs. It looks like I have a posterior thoracic air sac, two of them, one on each side. It looks like I have an abdominal air sac, also two of them, one on each side. Lots of air sacs to keep oxygen so birds can function at super high rates. Also, specially designed respiratory system, the bird's voice box, that's the syrinx. In humans, we have something called a larynx with an L. Birds have a syrinx. has a membrane that vibrates when air passes over it. Some birds have two membranes that allow them to produce two different notes at the same time. So that's why they call to each other with their uh, voices and with their songs, why birds are sometimes, uh, like songbirds, are, are uh, highly prized because they're so, uh, their songs are so melodic and so enjoyable because oftentimes they have special pitches. And that's pretty much our notes for today. So hopefully you'll have them all done. Hopefully this video didn't take too long. You can stop it, of course, as you go along to put in whatever you need or go back and replay it. Okay, your notes are all set for AVs. You're looking forward to a uh, web quest, it looks like, on Tuesday and a review, as well as our test coming up soon. So pay attention to the daily folders. 
on exactly what those assignments are. All right, take care. God bless. Have a really great day.